Hello and welcome to EOK Podcast. This is episode 217. Our guest today is Mr. Eric Dobson with Angel Capital Group. I'd like to thank our wonderful sponsors, Pershing Yokely and Associates, for providing the space that we're in, the bandwidth that we're consuming massive amounts of right now. I don't know what it costs. Maybe it's probably millions of dollars. We are streaming at like four megs a second. Something. Yeah, I mean, it is amazing. They have fiber in the space, uh, the Metro E kind of stuff is just awesome. So go thank them by visiting their website at pyapc.com. Also, I want to thank our wonderful sponsor, Ludica Neely Group, who provides us uh, cash. We appreciate that too. We, we love cash. And we put that in the checking account and we spend it on all you guys. So, so. You can find them online at lng-patent.com. They are our favorite patent attorneys, intellectual property, copyright, trademarks, patents. And talk to Robbie Robinson when you go down there. Great guy, member of EOK, easy to find. Uh, also, I want to thank Neighborhood Nerds. They provide residential and small business technical support for a small monthly fee. Online at schnerd.com, shnerd.com. And the reason we call it schnerd.com is we're located in Sequoia Hills with our first shop, which is going to be one of many. And the first one's in Sequoia Hills, so it's sequoiahillsnerd.com, schnerd. All right, let's get started with Mr. Harris Dobson. <clears throat> yeah. It's easy for me to remember. I said it first time. Uh, Mr. Eric Dobson, uh, I met him whenever he was pitching TrackLock, a very cool product. Uh, I was at an Angel Capital Group meeting, I think one of the very early ones in the basement of Copper Cellar. And Eric stood up and did his presentation and talked about TrackLock, and I was like, hey, this is an amazing thing. This is really cool. And then we've known each other since then, and uh, now Eric uh, runs Angel Capital Group here in the Knoxville area. And has just been a great guy, a very strong supporter of Entrepreneurs in Knoxville. Thinks that this is a very needed organization in any community to have a grassroots uh, education, information, and exchange between entrepreneurs and just share their experiences. So that also attracted me to him. Make the point very much. Uh, but let's, let's start off with your early years. <clears throat> we'll back up a little bit. You were not. You're born, <laughs> but you went to UT and you got a degree in geography. Geography. Yep. So you, so you get a degree in geography and Current you're carrying geography. Okay. And you end up running an angel capital group and building a GPS location system. So you, so you're at UT, you get your uh, degree in uh, geog geography, and then how did you get into I'm guessing you got into computers somewhere along the line. Did you have an affinity for computers? Or Always. Uh, parents supported that. Uh, bought me an Atari 400 at a young, impressionable age. I learned to program basic very early. And so and I actually went to University of Tennessee on the, on the assumption that I was going to be a computer science major. So that, that lasted for about two years. And I grew tired of you know consuming Twinkies and Cokes late nights in computer <laughs> laboratories and decided this wasn't for me. So left and went to geography and had a completely different experience, but the two combined gave me a unique um, skill set that I exploited throughout my 20s and, and then became this entrepreneur thing in my 30s. So. But you had a, uh, I mean, you come out of school, smart guy, get your master's, uh, did you get your PhD like yeah. immediately? So if master's or PhD, you come out, you get a nice job, and you're working, and they, they're like, this, you know, uh, this guy knows uh, mapping kind of stuff. He knows computers very well. Uh, he's pretty unique, yeah, in the, in the industry. So you're making a good living. You're working. You're doing your stuff. You have a family. <clears throat> How do you go from you know this wonderful, comfortable corporate life of planning for retirement and everybody's loving you and you're a rock star to I want to just disrupt all this, <laughs> throw it all out the window, and I'm going to go do my own thing. I think a better question is, how did I get this my wife? <laughs> um, you know, it, it, was, it, was a, it was a culmination of several events. I was actually working for the government and doing some, neat, some really neat projects. I mean, large, you know, large scale um, satellite mapping analysis, you know, resource inventory kind of things, a lot of field work. I really had a, what I consider to be a fantastic job. But I just kept being frustrated by the fact there were things going across my desk that I, I really thought had commercial value. I really wanted to work on them, and I just didn't have that, that time and chance. So I just started 
over time, in fact, my first company came out of the fact that I had sort of worked my way up to a, a nice group of, I was in Charleston, South Carolina, the old Navy base, and I, so I was looking out over the river and I kept seeing these big ships rolling in and out with these containers on them. They were just massive, and I kept wondering, how, how do they track those containers? How do they keep up with them? Who, who knows what's in them and where, where they're coming from and going to? And, how, how in the world would you maintain any kind of security on that thing? So that started out a, a ten-year odyssey, just asking those questions. Um, About what time was that? Uh, well, that was 1997. I started getting the bug. By 2000, I actually did jump out. But I think the big when people ask, "What moment did you know it was time to move, make, make the leap?" And it, and it was actually we had won a big um, award from the Department of Commerce. And uh, I was sitting, and I, I was on the team that basically won, the, won a big proposal, and, and we, so we had a, a big dinner with the president, the vice president of the company at the time that I was working for. And I was sitting with them, and I asked the president of the company, I said, when did you, dis when did you decide time to, to step out and become an entrepreneur? And he said, the day I realized there was no risk. <laughs> what the heck are you talking about? <laughs> And he looked at me in the eye and he said, I realized that I was good. If this entrepreneurship thing didn't work out, I'd go right back to doing it again. There was no downside. So a safety net. Yeah, and effectively, and so he, he that, that gave me a tremendous insight, first of all, in the mind of an entrepreneur. And then the other thing, we're sitting there after dinner and I'm chatting with the vice president of the company that had recruited me, and he just flat out looked at me and said, I wish I knew at your age, what I know now. He said, I would have been out there, I would have been out to start a company, I would have been doing, he said, I don't know where I'd be right now, but I know it would have been an amazing ride. And boy, I just thought, you know, if, if, you, if you, you talk about signs, you know, there were just too many, too many signs. So I went home and talked to my wife and said exactly that. Hey, you know, we've been really smart for our 20s, we've got you know, a nice house, new cars, 401ks, IRAs. I'd like to liquidate all that and start a company. How do you feel about that? <laughs> so we had, uh, after the initial shock and shock and off, uh, we decided to, you know, we're going to go forward. So I worked for a full year, full time, dumping all my disposable income into my first company. Um, liquidated my 401k, which actually turned out to be in my favor because just before the, the bubble burst in 2000, so I actually suffered badly on that one. And took the equity out of our house and started the company. So that was the first company called Trackwall? <clears throat> Navigational Sciences. Um, we were actually licensing some bridge technology. Um, we were going to apply to an RFID tracking system for shipping containers. And um, it's, it's an interesting study in, in how that worked because we were developing some really cutting edge uh, radio frequency technology. And so it was a big R&D program for about three years, three, four years before we were going to see a product out of it. You couldn't do that today. You couldn't raise the kind of money we raised. Uh, in that time frame for a project that had a four-year horizon to a, to a product. Um, unfortunately, the market window closed on us, and we tried to pivot and go into um, telecom space instead of an RFID space. And so I, we recruited a new CEO, and he took that company and went off. But I took the core of what I had learned from that, and that's what became TrackMark. OK. Um, as I was out marketing this whole RFID system, the shipping companies kept telling me, Got to, you know, they, gave, gave, they gave me the constraints for my next product, which was fantastic. It needed to be removable and reusable. It needed to be secure. And, and those two things sound contradictory. How can it be removable and reusable but secure? And it had to be everywhere, anytime connectivity. So th those, I, I sort of pondered those things and came up with the idea of track lock. I found an investor up here, and that's what brought me back to the announcement. <clears throat> so I'm still like, like to get to that picking that one that you want to do mm -hmm. because you're doing GIS. So, so you're good at you know data analysis and crunching and like representing data. Big data framework. before it's called that. Yeah, yeah. Did you did you know who your target customer was going to be? Did you do market research of like how uh, was this something that was needed in the market, uh, or did you just have that gut feel of Wonder of there's a lot of these shipping containers. How do they keep track? Well, at least really you know, I did. It was, it was interesting. So again, I was working for about a full year, so I was um, doing a lot of a lot of market research, a lot of studies out at the time, um, and just started calling shipping companies. I mean, not rocket science. Call, <laughs> ask. You know, that was the sort of thing. And the interesting twist is we had 
in the first year of that company, we actually had a letter of intent uh, from Bears to acquire the company. I thought, holy cow, this is, you know, got the tiger by the tail. Wow, this is good. And it was interesting because the day we were supposed to start negotiations, um, I got up to a news brief that um, Maersk had sold their whole data division to IBM. Hello? Hello? <laughs> anybody there? Yeah. Couldn't, couldn't get anybody, couldn't even get them off the phone. So that, that went poof, right in front of me. So we, we forged on, but, you know, I knew at that point when Maersk, a the company the size of Maersk is willing to acquire a, a relative startup with hot technology that there was a it was definitely a market thing. Now, to get your first investor, did you <clears throat> did you have uh, how much work had you already done? Like, you, you're putting your money into it. Do you, oh, you have some intellectual property? Do you have IP? Did you control? Um, well, it was all licensed at the time. We did file some additional patents in conjunction with Oak Ridge uh, over time, but uh, you licensed the technology from the licensed lab. Licensed from the laboratory uh, back then. So it was, you know, it was it was a broad patent portfolio. It was very impressive patent. But it was all business. Okay. Yeah. And so that, because I wonder about that now, like, do you build a prototype? Do you uh, sell some of the product first? You know, like, you show that it has the potential before you go get the investors, or you get the investors off of the drawing and some IP? Yeah, things are changing a bit now. Um, to really get meaningful fund, you know, well, first of all, we ended up working with an investment banker at that point. Okay. Um, after we ran out of my capital, we, <laughs> we went out to the market. And, and I don't want to get too far along with that because yeah. I also want to talk about track life just a little bit more okay. your exit. Sure. So at some point you're you're going along. I saw your pitch at uh, Angel Capital. You thought it was great. ACG invested. Yes, ACG and was the first money to track that. Okay. Yeah. And uh, great story. Good looking product. Sound like it was really needed. Uh, national security. You know, uh, it had to be locked and unlocked at destination. And so you know, uh, endpoint. But man, this is a cool thing. Um, then at what point, how do you know when it's time to exit? Uh, are there people making you offers? Yeah, um, it's always a challenge. Um, you know, exit early and often. That's the, the kind of the phrase in the marketplace right now you hear a lot. Um, you know, early exits, which is a whole topic we can, we can go on to, is sort of, is sort of the, the, the mindset now that investors want. And to go back just a point earlier, in the time frame I was raising capital for that company, Navigational Sciences, you could raise meaningful capital without a prototype. Okay. You could. You can't today. <laughs> Unfortunately, the, the, the times have changed. The valuations have gone down significantly in that time frame. And um, you really have to have at least an alpha, if not a beta, a prototype, and, and an early adopter now to get meaningful capital okay. in the marketplace. <clears throat> so you exit track lock. You hang out and sit on the beach for a year yeah. or two. And I wish. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, you know, track lock is still a, is still a going concern. So it's, it's moving on and, and uh, expanding. They're doing you know, some product revisions. I think they're really going to broaden its marketplace. And um, the question was when to leave and what to do afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, so when, when to leave was very simple. When it became more of an engineering exercise, and needed a, an operations-oriented CEO to, to take the product that we had developed, which I still think is pretty, pretty impressive, and make that into you know optimize. We had the we had the sales cycles were rolling, but we really needed to optimize the product itself to get um, get the margins out of it that we needed to make the company and what what it should be. So at that point, I said that you really can't have to. Yeah. It just doesn't work. You got to have somebody that's in charge. So it was time for me to exit, and so there was, a, you know, I still maintain a very large share position. I'm still on the board of that company, and still helping guide it. But um, Tom turned it over to Tom Mann, who was my chief operating officer at the time, and he's, he's not running that company. How to know? It's, it's always a challenge. Um, in that case, it was it was great. Clear that we needed to move to an operational paradigm instead of a startup visionary product development paradigm. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, I would have exited navigational sciences to the marriage in a heartbeat, and it was product wasn't even done. So, uh, off, off, obviously, offers. Um, knowing you're you have some numbers in your head, you know. Yeah, usually, yeah, there's another way to look at it. Uh, obviously, you've got your, sort of your minimum. Minimum walk away. Yeah, absolutely. You know that. Know, know that early. Makes me good. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. 
So then uh, uh, Rachel Qualls we talked to into running the Knox chapter of Angel Capital Group. You know, I called her and said, you know, hey, um, it's time for me to go do the next big thing. And actually, I called her more in the sense to get a feel for the startup landscape, what was in the portfolio of Angel Capital Group to see if there was something that was of interest to me. And she said, you know, we've got this neat, neat concept where we really want to scale it. I need somebody to help me really make this Angel Capital Group thing a, you know, a national brand right. and sort of fill in the middle America um, Angel Capital with the, with the lack of, of um, quality deal flow nationally relevant scale that we were seeing in, in sort of the great middle America section. And um, you know that and the fact that uh, we're actually getting some investment money from a California firm that's a uh, firm of fund that's, that's forming up right now uh, to invest. We're going to have, we invest in a company a month now, and we're probably going to two companies a month starting later this year. Mm -hmm. So uh, the other thing I'll say is that the model impressed me. Um, in terms of diversification of the, the portfolio, in terms of the speed, I mean, in terms of angel capital groups, you'll, in general, in a general sense, what you'll see is a four to six month process typically from, yes, uh, we're interested in, in, in your company to basically, it, it can be as long as nine months to get a check. Um, we have an eight to 10 week process. Right. Both. So it's, it's intensive and it's fast. Very fast. And, uh, so I, I like the pace of it, I like the vision. And you know, Rachel's just an amazing, amazing lady in her, in her own right. And uh, I've seen some of the, uh, the portfolio, like of Angel Capital Group. Uh, I know the Tings came in, Patrick Hunt mm -hmm. pitched. Um, I know the Track Lock pitched, uh, Spruce mm -hmm. was in there. Yep. Uh, several medical devices that I've seen uh, cancer treatments, cancer sure. diagnostics, um, just you know, a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you? What, what do you look for, and how, one, how do you find one? Where do you go to look for someone to say, hey, I need to see what you're doing, you know, see if you would be the right fit to come in front of my investors? Well, a couple things. One, um, smart entrepreneurs are always looking, and there are places they tend to congregate. So, you know, there's some innovation centers around you know, Raleigh, Durham, um, Atlanta. To a certain extent, Nashville, if you're looking at MedDevice and Biotech, um, you know, I think Knoxville's got the potential with everything sitting here. I, I think it could be a real innovation center, and that's one reason I'm happy to be here. Um, fairly easy to, to make those inroads connections. One of the things I do, I call up venture capital firms that are sort of a, a capital step above us, and they say, here's what we do. When you find companies you really like, but they're too young for you, yeah. send them to me. Okay. So I get referrals that way. Um, conferences of all types. You know, there, there are constant pitch conferences all over the southeast, uh, all over everywhere. But I mean, I, I tend to really focus on the southeast right now. Um, I spend about five to ten percent of my time doing outreach. Uh, about fifty percent of my time doing evaluation. When they when they, when they come through our processes, to, to actually talk to the fifty percent. Forty percent is uh, intensive diligence and structuring, deal structuring. Get everybody on the chapter, the wedding chapel on time. Okay. Now, Rachel came to one of our quarterly events and she laid out the Angel Capital Group kind of checklist of how you guys internally uh, make apples to apples comparisons between entrepreneurs. And which is a great challenge. If you're going like one to ten or something like that, and the higher score is like, cool, you know, here's something we want to look at. And I asked her then, I said, well, can you give us like a document to guide our entrepreneurs to line up better with what you're looking at? She said, yeah, we can work with something like that. But then I'm listening to you and I'm thinking maybe the OK needs to be working on more pitch competitions. You know, in front of people having the uh, lining it up maybe down at Market Square at their new uh, entrepreneur center. Yeah, just have entrepreneurs coming through, little prizes for you know, smaller pitch competitions, yeah. and have people like you sitting in the audience saying, I like that. I mean, yeah. Here's what you need to do. Um, I think that's a great idea. I, I think you know, the, the more we can celebrate entrepreneurship in our um, out front in public, uh, the better. I mean, if you look at any of the what I call the innovation centers like Raleigh Durham, they have an entrepreneurship complex in the middle of downtown and it's intermixed with bars and restaurants and it sort of says we celebrate 
entrepreneurship the same way we talk about a new restaurant in town. It's, it's an exciting, happening kind of place, and that's it's it's. I'm thrilled to death to see that storefront open because that's something I see in every city that I think of as a business innovation center of innovation. Austin, yeah. you know, it's, it, that's, uh, it was definitely missing from our landscape. Definitely missing from our landscape. It's just yeah, entrepreneurs just confused about where they're supposed to go. Exactly. Like, do I go where to go? Store, where do I go to the chamber, chamber? Tech 20. Yeah. I mean, there's all sorts of resources, but they were fairly disjointed. Uh, and most of them get discouraged when they go meet with someone. You know, like, they go to the chamber, and the chamber's like, yeah, that's cool. You know, maybe when you get your business off the ground, you can call me. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, no, there's no question. Uh, you know, chambers have their places. There's no question. Uh, for startups, um, especially if you're talking about you know, high growth potential startups, and chambers don't really, especially if you're not marketing to, to a local audience, they have, that's their responsibility. So you know, they, that's their they job. That's what they do. They do it incredibly well. But, you know, if you're really looking at selling just confusing to a startup. internationally or nationally, they don't offer as many tools. Uh, as, as, a, as a startup who really, really needs. So what, what does an entrepreneur do? Like they have a uh, idea for a widget. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're, it's actually a physical product that they're, they, you know, they say the entire world needs this thing. The right. world is my customer. Right. I'm going to make, if I just get 10% of the market, I'm going to make $250 billion this year. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> so they, they come to, you know, what should they really have? <laughs> So they come to you know what what do you what do you say to them or what are you looking for what what do you normally see what would you like to see? Well, it's interesting. We um, Rachel, one of the things she asked me to do when I came in was to codify some of this stuff and create. Um, we actually launched our own platform for Angel Capital Group, which includes a deal intake infrastructure now, which goes through a, a screen that basically says you know we're looking for companies that have a management team in place. We want companies that have valuations between 1.5 and 5.5 million uh, pre-money valuation. We want companies that can realistically achieve 15 to 30 million dollars in annual revenue in five years. Um, so we've got, we've got a, you know, a, a screen process now and so that is sort of the, the, the door. It's like seven questions and basically that's the door into, into, our, into my world. From yeah. that point on we start capturing more business oriented information to evaluate. A management team, I can see an entrepreneur saying, okay, I know my strengths and weaknesses. I can find the experience and the, and the team that I need to fill in around me. Sure. But then valuation always seems to be an issue. And, and especially when you said pre revenue valuation. It's so like, okay, I haven't made any money yet. So I can't use that to say, and then you know, forecast off of, if I'm selling this many at this rate, people are paying me. And then I can calculate what my value would be. Okay. So you're saying pre-revenue valuation. How do you do that? It's always a challenge. Um, you know, in, in, the, in, the, late in the 90s, you could put a $3 million pre-money valuation on something and nobody would blink an eye. In the, in the 2000s, you could put a $2 million pre-money valuation on anything in the early 2000s and get away with it. Um, now, you're lucky to get a 1.5 on, on that kind of thing. Now, the reason that's challenging is very simple. Uh, pre, your valuation of directly sort of guides how much you, how much share of each uh, equity you have to give up for a round of funding to be for a meaningful round of funding. So as valuations have gone down, the capital raises have been adjusted. And you know, personally, I think the valuations are reaching a point where they're almost counterproductive. Because companies can't execute the game plan on the money they can raise for the stock they have to give up. So I think there's some things that are going to change that in the marketplace with crowdfunding next year or a little bit. I think it's going to go back to, well, right now it's a buyer's market. So let's, let's just be honest. People like me can come and say, I love your company, I think the world of you, but this is what we're doing. Yeah. And I'll give you 100000 for 90% of your company. Exactly. Yeah. Take it or leave. No, each, each, each <laughs> significant round of funding. That's just you know, that's that's just a number. It shocks a lot of entrepreneurs when you start talking. How do you about count that. Uh, like a, mm -hmm. the founders' investment? So the founders group up their money and they put a uh, million dollars into the company. Uh, do you say it's worth a million dollars? If they really put a million in, oh, absolutely, we give you credit. I mean, the real money on the on the on the 
table is, is uh, real money on the table. Yeah, what do you it's mostly separate sweat equity. We understand that. Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. So, so they say there's a million dollars of hard cash that we, the four of us, have put in two fifty each, mm -hmm. and then there, and then, but these two dudes work full time at the job and we're counting them uh, hundred thousand dollars each for sweat equity this year. Mm -hmm. Uh, would you say yeah, that's cool? Yeah, yeah. one point two. That's oh, yeah, easy. I wouldn't yeah. have any problem with that. Um, now, what separates that from how how far out is your like next investor? Like somebody that comes in that's not associated with the founding team or anything, and they say, "I just want to put some money into this for my piece." Um, is that do you look at that and say that has to be six months away from you? We typically want to give a company enough money to run for six months okay. without having to raise capital because raising capital is a full time job for somebody and choosing the CEO you'd rather than be selling products than change. Yeah. Pure and simple. Um, ideally, companies should be thinking about raising enough capital to run for a year. So the, the bottom line is it takes about anywhere from three to six months to raise your round of funding. You don't want to do that. While well, you're raising six months worth of capital, guess what? You just started, you just you got your funding and you're starting to chase another one. And it just it, it distracts management from what they should be doing, which is product development and product sales. So you know, we'd like to see a company, but you know, we also realize that um, our place in the market is fairly early stage capital. Um, we know they're going to be follow on investments, and so we do like at least six months of funding rounds. So yeah. the company can actually focus on their business model instead of investment. Okay. Yeah. So let's, uh, you, you you come in, um, you have a you, you want to see them. You, you said pre-revenue valuations, but uh, what if they're post-revenue? They've been selling the product. They have a team in place, and they're making some money. Then it comes down to really those are the easier negotiation to have because the, the reality is that they get team product. Revenue, then it's just so they're just wanting to scale. You're looking, then you just look for comps in the industry. You know, similar companies, um, what their valuations are, or most importantly, if you can find other companies in the marketplace that have exited, you look at their revenue multiples. Uh, so for med device, you may be looking at six or seven times revenue multiple for every stage exit. So I mean, those, those can be. So you're making 500,000 in revenue, and you're looking at 6x six, six multiple, it's 3 million per month. It's fairly straightforward. Once you've got revenue, it's very straightforward. So you said six three times. Uh, is that, that the factor different for different industries? Oh, yeah. It is the second. Yeah, very, very different. Um, the service sector, I mean, it may be 1.5. For a you know, product company, you know, two, two x something like that. For a company with real recurring revenue, software kind of play, like you may have seven, eight, seven, eight times more on a revenue. Okay. Yep. Uh, kind of walk everybody through so if they haven't seen it before. Um, you've talked to the entrepreneur, you feel like it's a good play, you kind of got the reduction. Do you coach them any before they go in the room to pitch to you or invest in? We, 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 we have, that's part of the diligence process. We go through, we do a dry run. cost anything? No, the diligence. No, no, we never charge on anything um, for applying. Um, the only thing they have to be responsible for, they have to cover their own travel to make presentations for various chapters. That's the only thing they have to do. Um, so coaching, yes, we, we do fairly extensive coaching. And even folks that have been through it before, it, it's funny. Um, we still end up coaching, especially in the presentations. Presentations are uh, kind of a specific skill set. Yeah. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a form and a, and, a, and a flow to these things that needs to be there, an efficiency of words, but at the same time, you know, engaging, you know, an engaging um, process that has to be there. Uh, so we do a lot of coaching. How objective are you as the lead for the angel capital group in Knoxville between your investors and the entrepreneur? Like, do you get on the side of the entrepreneur and say, you know, this is a great one, you guys need to be investing in this one, or do you sit on the other side and go, what about this? What about that? What about that? You know, it's 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 always a delicate line to walk, um, but you know we have agreed internally that our responsibility is to our investors. Okay. So um, we find the best companies we can possibly find in the marketplace, 
And there's some fantastic companies out there in the marketplace right now. So we're, we're, we're not hurting for deal flow in any way, shape, or form. In fact, there's four or five companies I would put money in right now if we could. Um, but I have to give a realistic appraisal of the company, the management team, their challenges. And so we try, we try and actually focus on that. Because there's, there's only one thing I guarantee you in, in private equity financing and startups. You're going to lose at least 30% of your portfolio. <laughs> That's the only thing I can guarantee, and it may be more than that. But you know, as an investor, if you can't bear to lose this, if you can't take a joke, don't it. <laughs> no, um, I, I say that flippantly, but you know, it, it is risky investing. There's no question. It is the high risk portion of anyone's portfolio, and that's also why it's fun. You know, I was at an angel um, capital association meeting. One of the guys said, "Why do we enjoy this so much? We invest in these companies." We hold them for five, you know, five to seven years. Some of them exit. Some of them go nowhere. Why do we? Why do we do this? You know, we're all insiders. We, you know, we're waiting for the for the most the next company update to see if they, you know, they change the change the world. Um, so part of it's just fun. So tell us about some of the uh, some examples of deals. Because uh, I, I still don't know if I understand it completely. So you come in and you're this company XYZ LLC. You've been operating, and you come to bank account and you pitch. Now, how do they actually put the funds in? What okay. kind of equity do they ask for? Okay, so any control. Um, when a company applies and goes through, and you finally make the decision that yeah, we're, we're serious about this company, we're going to invest in them. So what what happens is very simple. We go through a very intensive four week diligence process. We you know crawl through their underwear drawers and look for, you know, we, we want to know contracts, we want to know everything about your company. Um, we're going to do background checks, we're going to do, um, you know, reference we calls, cycle. we can even do psychometric um, evaluation of these folks to see, how, and, and by the way, we do that for one reason, it's to see how we can help these companies without getting in their way. The, the, the worst thing you can have is a runaway investor who wants to be helpful. Um, doesn't know how to <laughs> that's, my, that's my former CEO talking. Uh, anyway, the uh, once once we get that all that diligence pans out, and we're confident that the company is sound. There's no legal issues. The intellectual property is, is solid. Whatever whatever their assets are, we go ahead and structure a term sheet. Up front. That's the one way we're different. We do all the diligence inside the inside the very concentrated focus um, portion of our network, and we do we do go out to our members and ask for. Or feedback on specific um, topics, but the, we do all the diligence and we do structure all the term sheets up front. So when a company for us goes to present, they literally are asking for money. I, I'm here to get money, and the investors make individual decisions on whether or not to invest in the, in the company. We pool all that money and put it in the company. Now the term sheets we offer, uh, we'll, we do basically three things. We do some you know, garden, you know, garden variety vanilla equity deals I'm here. We're going to we expect X of your company, and that's purely based on valuation. Mm -hmm. How much money you want to raise, and what kind of valuation um, decides the stock. It's, it's not, again, that's a fairly straightforward map once you once you've got the two those two endpoints. Um, the other thing we do, we do some convertible debt, but we don't like that. I love it as an entrepreneur, former entrepreneur, but Rachel doesn't, so we don't do a lot of it. Um, but in that case, we loan a company money, and then we have a discount to the. It converts on the next qualified financing. Knowing we're going to have another round of funding, uh, and it converts at a discount to that. So we we, re, we realize a, a bump in valuation, and, and there's usually some carried interest in there that's converted as well. Um, great way to do a bridge if you if you've got you know I know I need a couple months worth of bridge to get to another financing or another big milestone. Uh, it's a great tool to use for raising some short-term capital. It's usually faster, much faster than than a full equity round. The last thing we do is kind of an interesting new twist in the marketplace. You're seeing now what they call revenue share deals. Uh, and, and some of these are, um, there's two or three different flavors, but ours is very specific. We actually loan the company money technically. So we don't have, have any shares or anything. We give them a year to get their revenues up and rolling, and then they pay us a percentage of the revenues going forward uh, for a period of usually five years. So after five years, we're out of the company's life. We have no stock. We never take a board seat. We don't have any oversight um, um, rights and restrictions. And so that's it's kind of interesting in the marketplace. Uh, we've used that for uh, consumer products. We've used that. Um, I think we did actually a um, I think we did a uh, biotech company as well in, in that space. So we're testing that to see how it's going to work. 
because one of the things we're structuring for our investors, um, you know, first, first, first parties investors, second parties companies in that order. Um, one of the things we're trying to make sure we have pay, you know, shorter term payouts for our investors combined with longer term big big exits. So, it's, so you um, would do those only on ones that are going to be generating revenue within a year or something? Well, one of our criteria is we want the company to credibly be making meaningful revenue within six months of our investment. That's about as early as we're willing to come in. Biotech is really tough in that because sometimes it's you know, a year you know, before they're even going to start their FDA. Uh, five, 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 ten k that's it, five, ten k sorry, uh, approvals. Those can be really challenging. If you want to buy biotech early and cheap, actually, if you want to buy it cheap, you got to buy it early versus buying it late and paying a premium for it. So it's always a challenge on biotech. So. And when you get that equity stake in a company like the first uh, option that you were talking about, like straight up, usually yeah. the investor coming in and getting a piece of the company, is there a way to get ACG out or how do you exit? Is it when the company exits? It's when the company exits, yeah. We hold those until exit. Um, we don't usually structure buybacks necessarily. Some companies want to do that. Um, you know, our stated goal is, a, is basically a buybacks return on our, on our portfolio. That's a good one. We want every company to, to be realistically able to return five times their capital. Um, and we do that because as a blended portfolio, that ends up being more like a 25 to 30 percent annual return, which is fantastic for the market. It's two, almost three times the S&P, top of 100. Um, so it can be very lucrative if it's done right. That last caveat is the important thing. Yeah. Success stories, failure stories, like a track record for ACG? Well, you know, the interesting thing is the real meat started up in 2008. We made some investments. I was, you know, I was on the outside at that time. We really didn't get rolling with the meat of the portfolio until about 2010. It's really when I think the, the, the model is solidified and, and, and Angel Capital really began to sort of sprint. Um, so most of our big exits are still looming on the, on the horizon. The, uh, as they say in the industry, the, the lemons ripen in two years and the plums ripen in five to seven. So we're still waiting on some of the bigger ones. We had one negative um, exit. Unfortunately, it's going to happen. Uh, we had, and we had some Facebook. So that's been our success story. We actually had some Facebook shares. Uh, so you know, we're one in one right now. What do you look for in investors? I mean, are, you, are you looking to bring more investors Absolutely. into the? Yeah, one of the things that's happening uh, in the marketplace you'll see is this whole concept of crowdfunding. And, and you know, crowdfunding exists right now, but it's usually sale of products. It's not sale of shares. It's illegal to do so. But as of next year, the expectation is that you'll be able to raise money on the internet um, for equity. So I, I think there's there's a I don't want to say commoditization or democratization, whatever you want to say, of of this sort of private equity angel capital thing. They're trying to expand it because it's now one of the few vehicles for starting companies. And if you look at uh, the changes in the 2000, just after 2008. The accredited investor status, which hadn't changed since 1934, by the way, um, which meant you had to have a million dollars in net, net worth and you had to have 225,000 in annual income to be an accredited investor and invest in private equity. That was set in 1934 and it hadn't changed. In 2008, Congress and Elizabeth Wisdom went ahead and said, okay, but you can no longer use your primary house as part of that calculation and inadvertently wiped out half the angels in the industry right in the middle of the recession. Good plan. Good plan. So they've gone back, and part of this crowdfunding thing is to reverse that trend because what happened is startup capital dried up for the you know, period of the market. So um, they're trying to loosen those restrictions and broaden it. So I think, I think within five years you're going to see private equity as sort of that ultra-aggressive um, part of the portfolio, but I think it'll be a standard part of, 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 a, of a diverse portfolio. Uh, so yes, we are looking for people that, have been, that for which this is fun, uh, especially folks that have been entrepreneurs themselves and understand the process. Private equity is kind of a squirrely beast in a lot of ways. Um, it doesn't behave like the public markets, and that's uh, it's fairly poorly understood. And there really isn't a good educational program anywhere that I've found uh, at the collegiate level that 
really teaches private equity. You kind of have to either be an entrepreneur or you know get in, get into it in some way, shape, or join a you know, private equity firm to really get in and understand private equity. So I think there's an educational hurdle that, that the industry is going to have to go through uh, this year fairly rapidly. But they're projecting 500 billion in crowdfunding equity, equity and other next year, which is a tenfold increase of the venture capital and angel capital in the marketplace this year. So you're going to have some sweeping changes. Uh, I think it's going to go from a buyer's market now, possibly to a seller's market, which will mean valuations for companies will go up. There's going to be a lot more money there. The so companies understand it. Yeah, it's a uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's a a ball. The business. <laughs> so and the large, but the. Uh, I invested in six companies. So it's going to be fascinating, but I think there's a growing awareness of it, and like I said, it's fun. Yep. A lot of fun. I was going to get some questions. Anybody have questions? Chris? Yep. So for a company who is not the least bit uh, interested in angel investments, however, sees a uh, See the similarity in what you're preaching to how they need to grow their great business. What I'm thinking is this idea of attracting angels. Mm -hmm. How would a company like mine make the right decisions in the early stages so that we would be attracted to an angel investor, even if we're not? Do you, you understand my point? Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of similarity there. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, there are some very simple things you can do to be investor friendly. Um, to be perfectly honest, and well, uh, let me back up. Companies that really want to achieve, really want to um, get capital, have to be sort of built to be sold from the start. Okay. The reality is, we want our money back. We have to have a very clear understanding of how that money is going to come back. So, first things first, I always tell companies, know your exit before you begin, and not just say, yeah, I'm going to be bought. Okay, that's that's not a strategy. That's a statement. Um, I want to know who's going to buy you. Why would they buy you, and how you're going to create value to them along the way, so that I can see a clear exit for your company? Because that's one of the biggest things I've got to see. Because my shares, I buy shares, but the reality is they're worth zero until you exit. It's private equity. It's paper. It's all speculation. So you know, just just from the start, understanding how to expect to exit, when you can expect to exit, and making sure that at every step of the way you're creating value for some for a company that would acquire you speaks volumes about the maturity of the management team and their ability um, that, that will directly reflect their ability to raise capital. The other thing you can see is uh, if you go out like the National Venture Capital Association has sample term sheets for equity deals and they're kind of the gold standard in the industry right now. Uh, NVCA.org is the place you can go to have sample documents. You can look at what a you know a series A, you know, when you raise capital, you raise First, you're raising seed capital, which is often uh, selling common shares. Then, when you go up to the first quote unquote professional round, it's usually called a preferred round, a Series A, Series B, Series C, in that order. Um, you'll see what it takes to get Series A capital. Uh, usually, you're looking at seed capital, where from 100 to 500, if you're looking for Series A, you're usually 1 to, two, one to 3 million. Series B is usually 2 to 6 million uh, kind, of, kind of tranches. But to get 2 million in, in equity, you can go look at those term sheets and they'll show you what you need to do uh, to structure yourself to raise capital. And, and you need to know that at least six months in advance of actually needing the capital. That's the other challenge. It can take six months easily to raise capital. So knowing that far out what you need to do is better. Because once you know, any, any, of the, any of the roadblocks you can take off the table for me makes my job easier and makes investing in you easier. What, uh, what advice do you have on filling the gap between like building that alpha product and getting to someone? Man. You need that twenty-five, fifty, hundred thousand dollars just to build that that prototype. That's always a challenge. Um, in the past, we've always jokingly called the people that invested that time frame, you know, friends, family, and fools. Um, there, there are individual angel investors that will come in at that stage, but the challenge, especially in today's world, is you know, people invest in people. So those people that invest in that stage are usually know the entrepreneur and know them well. Um, so that's one of the challenges. That's why one of the reasons EOK is such a fantastic platform because it, it is a sounding board for 
you know, companies to, and a network, amazing networking opportunity to find other people, to either find partners or co-founders or whatever, to get to those those early those early angels. That's a it's just that's what you got to do. Unfortunately, there are some really early seed funds out there, but they're few and far between. I mean, they're really far few and far between. I know we've been talking about them uh, from an from a uh, EOK perspective. The potential of some kind of a micro lending fund, and, and so we're, we're looking at how to structure something like that. I don't know how much you can talk about that, but you know, there, there's definitely a gap in the marketplace at the very low end, and then that's sort of the micro and the C. There's kind of little or no organized capital that flows at that point. We come in a little more. We call it startup. It's, you know, right right when a company has, you know, they've got a beta product, they've got early adopters. We completely see they're going to make revenue in six months. So we sort of come in and help them jump the chasm of debt, effectively, and get you know get through that that process to launch the product in the marketplace. Um, that's where we see the value, and, and I think venture capital firms will play as early as that. Some, most of them are beyond that. They want to be on the other side of the chasm, trying to go into your you know in really making inroads with your early majority. That's kind of a value. Yeah, what, what does an entrepreneur do if they have an idea and they're willing to go out and get some capital to get it off the ground, but they don't even have the money to, you know, get the entity formed and the uh, patent, yeah, and or the disclosure document. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, it's, even, it's a challenge. And that's like 20, 30 grand. Oh, you, you can know? you can easily spend. You know, there are a lot of before well, you even legal is always challenge because it's it's absolutely required as I say when you find a lawyer you'd like to keep them because you're gonna have to have them. Um, most lawyers understand that startups don't have the capital and sometimes they work equity. It's rare, they will occasionally. Most of them will have you know, sort of a startup package and they'll let you pay over some horizon on a startup package. Um, the good ones, the smart ones. And, and that's just something you just have to suck up and do. Is no, there's no good way to get around that unless you've done it before. And you can reuse documents that you had. And, and so sometimes you can. Sometimes we we don't tell the lawyers this, but the um, you know, when we have a company that really needs to do something, we normally have some more equipment that we've used in other companies. We can sort of say here, yeah, you should have your lawyer look at this quickly, but you know, this will save you quite per annum having somebody come back in and help you restructure. So we do as much of that as we can for the companies and help them with the documents. Uh, in terms of you know filing patents, again, having a good lawyer that understands the startup game and how to do it. There's just some fees you can't get around though. They just cost money to file a patent. That. You can use a provisional patent. I don't know how many people know what that looks like, but a provisional patent basically gives you a year of protection um, it only costs 125 bucks to file, depending on who writes it, and it's it's a it's a great way to go ahead and sort of draw a line in the sand. Um, you have one year to file a full patent uh, application on that, so you can you can conserve money. There's a lot of startup tools. Um, a guy named Steve Blank. Um, if you Google his name, his website will come up. But he's got one of the best um, compendiums I've ever seen of startup tools. Available on his website, and it's everything from how to do market research to how to find co-founders, uh, how to do presentations, a lot of training, a whole lot of fantastic information. He's also the author of the startup startup owners manual, I think it's called. So there, there's a lot of tools out there now that, that uh, Alex Lavage is another person you talk to here. He's, he's really knowledgeable in the space in terms of tools. But you know, if you look at what it used to cost twenty five thousand to do, if you use the tools, you can get that down to five or six. Which I'm not saying it's not still a good bit of cash, depending on what you're doing in your life. Uh, but I can tell you that the, the barrier to starting a company has never been lower. The bar you can trip over the water to start a company at this point, and you've got crowdfunding coming up in the in the on that, you know, 2014, you know, 14 time frame. It's an incredibly exciting time right now if you want to be an entrepreneur and raise real capital. Well, that, that's some. Of, that, that's what I'm hoping the, uh, the micro lending fund yeah. that you guys are working on will allow for the EOK members. Yeah. So they can apply to it and say, I need my six grand, seven grand, whatever, to get all my documentation in place yep. uh, so I can move forward. Well, exactly. And um, you know, if we can, I think that's kind of the target zone is you know, sort of 
two to ten thousand dollars, and, and with use the right tools, you can get a company form, get a patent filed, and, and have a you know a good start toward a, a business plan with a credible market market study for in that range. That's kind of what we're targeting. It's very different too. You look at micro lending outside of the U.S. and it's like hundred dollars, yeah, hundred dollars yeah. inside yeah. two grand, yeah. ten grand. Yeah. Yeah. Micro. Yeah. Yeah. Step in that yeah. My name is Seth White, and one of the big questions, one of the biggest issues that I have in mind um, with infant company and this startup is regulation. Um, and so I'm interested in knowing, as an investor, from your perspective, uh, what are the three largest challenges facing uh, those infant companies when it comes to regulation? Specifically. Uh, that's a great question. Three big, well, there are so many challenges, it's not even funny. Um, the, well, regulation, one thing. At this point in time, you're not allowed to go out and solicit for private equity. Um, so, you know, if you say, if, if a company says in a public forum, I want to raise, I, I'm raising $500,000 and I'm giving away Series A equity, they can be forced to become a public company. So you have to be very careful how, how you phrase that as part of the restrictions that they're lifting with this crowdfunding thing. So that's the, the dust hasn't settled yet on how that's going to what that's going to look like. But um, you do have to be careful how you say you're raising capital, especially when you go to these pitch competitions. You can't you, you can say we're seeking resources of five hundred thousand. So there, there are ways you can say it without saying it. Um, second thing in terms of regulation. There's, there's a lot of business licenses, and um, obviously there's SEC filings. If you want to raise capital, you do have to inform private equity. You, have to, you do have to inform the SEC. Uh, it's called Reg D, and so you've got to make sure you do all the filings. Often there's state filings as well. So uh, there, there's, there are those are called blue sky. But anyway, there, there are many things that you just would never imagine until you start this process, and that's one of the things that is a big educational challenge for the market in general, and again, this is something I think EOK is fantastic at, is how in the world do I navigate all these, these restrictions? Excuse me. So, um, if there's a third one I'm trying, to, I'm trying to come up with, but you're absolutely correct. There are some things you have to know that are tripwires that if you don't fulfill, you don't file the right paperwork, you can really get in trouble. Okay. Yeah. All right, we are... One more. One more question. Yep. So I listen to Mixergy a lot, and at not 60% of the time you hear somebody come on there and say, if you've got a great product and you've got great revenue, the investor will come to you. And then 50% of the time you'll have somebody on there that'll say, uh, you know, if you've got a good product and you've got good revenue, you should be seeking investment. I heard you say this before, before you, before you need it. You know, once, once you realize that it's, you know, something yeah. big is on the horizon. Uh, where, where, do you, where do you mostly fall in that play? Um, well, first things first, if you don't have to raise capital, don't raise it. But if you know you're going to raise capital, know it's six months in advance. Yeah. <laughs> That's one of the challenges. Um, right now, this is still a, a buyer's market. I mean, I, I don't have to do a whole lot of searching to find companies that want money. Right. <laughs> they, they tend to throw themselves at us uh, fairly, fairly violently. Um, so, you know, I, I don't really have to work too hard to, to find those companies, we do, again, we have a very strict process we go through to evaluate those companies' um, funding. And I'm not sure I'm addressing your question directly. What should you be practicing all the time? Absolutely. Should you be raising? You should be pitching every chance you get. Talk to anybody. Once you, you know, if you've got some internal revolutionary, file a provisional patent and talk to anybody that wants to see it. Pitch, 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 all the time. That's how you're going to find clients. That's how you're going to find investors. That's how you're going to find um, all sorts of opportunities. So well, I think you just I, get good I, feedback too. Well, oh, you get fantastic you have some smart investors and see a bunch of opportunities in the government. Yeah. Well, have you thought about this? Have you the other, thought about that? Absolutely. The other thing you're doing is you're building relationships now that you're doing in the future. So I, I tell companies act like you're raising capital all the time. Pitch, 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 pitch to anybody that will listen, and use and, and you. Build relationships when you don't need them so that you can use them when you do. All right. Well, thank you for being here today.
Media with a podcast, episode 217. Our guest today will be Eric Dobson. Find us online at eokhq.com and follow us on Twitter at eokhq. Thanks.